Hey Grace Church, my name is Josh. Welcome to the weekly for the week of August 27th. Today we are talking about the conversion of Saul. So in the Old Testament, there are lots of major figures in the Bible. You have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, David, Daniel, like these, these major characters. In the New Testament, Jesus is by far the primary main character of the New Testament. But in this week's sermon, we meet the second most influential character in the New Testament. His name is Saul, and we're going to see it turns into Paul. Uh, there are books written about the hundred most influential people in human history, and every one of these books has this guy, Saul, in the top ten of the most influential people in history because God used him to take the gospel to the Gentiles, to the non-Jewish people. Uh, ultimately, God used him to, to launch the movement outside of uh, Jerusalem. And so uh, when we look at his story, it's an unlikely conversion. I don't know if you have someone in your life where you're like, that person's never going to believe in God. That person would never come to believe in Christ. Uh, that's who Saul was, the most unlikely of converts. Uh, so unlikely when we pick up the story in Acts chapter 8, he's, he's persecuting the church. He's an enemy of the church. He's actually asked the authorities of the day if he could have more power to go to another city called Damascus and continue persecuting the church. And when we look at the story, here, here's the main idea. Uh, Paul's conversion and his calling, they serve as a pattern for our hope. He tells uh, Timothy that. Paul wrote two-thirds of the letters in the New Testament. One of those letters is 1 Timothy. And he recounts to Timothy his salvation. And he says this serves as a pattern for future generations to see the hope of the gospel in Jesus Christ. So the pattern that we see in Acts chapter 9 is, is pretty simple. It's just three things. Number one is that God is pursuing you. Uh, he's pursuing Paul. Paul, on the, on the way to Damascus, has a face-to-face -face confrontation with Jesus, where Jesus says, why are you persecuting me? Jesus is so connected to the church that to persecute the church means to persecute Jesus. One theologian says that there's, there's not one single threat or punishment towards Christians on earth that is not felt in heaven. So Jesus and the church are connected, and God is pursuing Saul and ultimately meets him on the road to Damascus in, in the most overwhelming of ways. Shows up as a bright light, throws him to the ground, confronts him, and transforms Saul's heart in an instant. And God is pursuing him, and that's, that's something that happens to us as well. Right now, God is pursuing you. He loves you and He's for you and He wants you to experience the goodness of Jesus. Secondly, uh, you've been blind. Uh, maybe your blindness was self-righteous blindness where you thought you had it all together. That's where Saul was at. He thought he was the guy that knew all the answers, the Pharisee of the Pharisees, the most well-known student among the students in that generation. Uh, he, he believed that Jesus was a false prophet. He believed that all these Christians were heretics and he was blinded by his self-righteousness. Or maybe you're blinded by your unrighteousness, where you're running from God, you're living in sin, you're doing all these things, and you're, you're walking in blindness, and yet God still pursues you. And then lastly, we see that your past, my past, Saul's past, your past does not disqualify you from God's grace. God's pursuing you in the midst of your blindness. And whatever you've gone through, Saul serves as a pattern to say that the, the most unlikely of Jesus followers can be redeemed by Christ. The people with the most dark pasts and, and broken circumstances can be redeemed by Christ. It's a pattern for our hope. And Saul, uh, his transformation shows us that anyone can be transformed, that the power of the Holy Spirit is powerful enough to transform anyone. And then Saul, that's his conversion. It moves into his calling. And his calling is fascinating because when you see he finally gets his sight back, he finally experiences uh, you, you know, the, the restoration of his vision, and, and he's called to suffer. And, and so it's, it says that, that he was chosen, yet he was opposed. You see, in his whole life, Saul was opposed. Paul was chosen, yet it took many years to prepare him. He spends 15 years in Galatia preparing to do missionary work. Paul was chosen, yet he suffered. Uh, even in the text, the Lord says to Ananias in verse 15, Go, this man, Paul, is a chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and to their kings and to the people of Israel. Verse 16 is crushing. I will show him how he much he must suffer for my name. Now, I don't know if that fits into your theological framework, but, but yes, God's pursuing you. Yes, 
you've been blind, but God loves you. And yes, your past does not disqualify you. But if you're being called into a life of being a disciple of Jesus, that does not mean a call free from suffering. It does not mean a call free from opposition. It does not mean a call free from preparation. All of this is a pattern for us. And yes, God in His infinite wisdom can receive more glory in our suffering than in our prosperity. Yes, God in His infinite wisdom can receive more glory from us being opposed than us being accepted. And Paul serves as a model for that. And all of this should lead us to desire to be transformed by Christ and to be like Christ. And that's what we see Paul say in Philippians chapter 3, that, that he, he gets arrested by Christ. It's the same term, that he was on the way to Damascus to arrest Christians. But in Philippians 3, Jesus arrested him. Jesus pursued him and snatched him up. And then Paul said it changed him to where now, instead of wanting to uh, kill Christians, he wanted to lay down his life as a Christian. And he, he's so overwhelmed by God in the gospel, so overwhelmed by Christ, that he longs, he leaves everything behind, and he longs to receive the resurrection. That should be our hope. Christians, you, you have the hope that even if you're suffering, even if you're opposed, God's pursued you, the resurrection is on the way, and by God's grace we will experience His power one day. So I hope Paul's story can encourage our story and give us hope as we follow Jesus in our generation.